Okay, well, we're going to break bread thinking about Ruth chapter three, which is where Ruth kind of proposes to Boaz. But of course, all this is looking forward to the Lord Jesus, who is our real redeemer. Boaz was the redeemer of this poor woman, Ruth, and he is our redeemer. So let's start with, with a prayer. Lord God, our heavenly father, we come to you and we come to your son. And we are coming to you through the book of Ruth, as it were, coming to him through the book of Ruth. And we pray that you will open our eyes there to what's going on and that we might see the wonderful truth of your basic love and passion toward us. And we pray for each of us in our paths. We pray for those who can't be here, who would like to have been here, like Darren and Siri and, and others. We pray that you'll be with them and that You'll bless all the various issues that we all just raised in the last 10 minutes or so. Please help those who are damaged by church politics. Please be with, with Audrey's plans for the welfare of others. Please bless the efforts that I'm making in, in London to start some sort of a, a center here, some sort of a church. Please, Father, bless Arash and all of us, actually, in our struggles towards forgiveness. We pray that he and we each might achieve that, motivated by our own experience of your forgiveness. We pray for Brother Joseph in Israel. We pray for his preaching of the gospel and the contacts that he's talking to about baptism there. We pray that you bless his sister in her health and in her operation. We pray that you'll be with Rocky as he also desires to grow in you and to be deeper in your word. And we pray for Modesta also in Israel that you will help her in her desire to find joy in your word. And we pray for her colleague, her work colleague, that you'll be and bless him. We pray for the little ones, as Miriam said, and that we might be able to find people to reach out to people, as Audrey said, that we might be able to have meetings of people whom we can bring to the gospel and to the hope of your kingdom. We think, Father, of Phil and Miri in their amazing work with uh, young folks where they are. And we pray that you will bless them as they try to guide those young people to a godly life. But Father, as Mike said, we, <laughs> We worry for younger people, for those brought up with screens and videos all the time, putting stuff in their heads. We pray that you will lead them somehow, that generation, to know your son and to be spiritually minded and to have the mind of Christ and to have the wisdom to refuse the, the bad and to choose the good in all things. So, Father, we come to you in all our all our many issues and weaknesses, but above all things, we want to be focused upon the Lord Jesus, as Phil said. We want to have that simple focus on the things of your kingdom. But of course, it's our desire to share this with other people. And we do pray for our families and our loved ones, and James and his family, whom he wants to respond to the gospel. But Father, keep us focused upon the Lord Jesus and upon your love for us in him. And may that always be our own personal security in whatever happens in our lives, in our relationships with others, that we know you and you know us and that you know your people and that you will not give us anything too great to endure so that we might stumble and put forth our hand unto iniquity. So please, Father, keep us in the way. Please guide us. Please encourage us. For Jesus' sake. Right, well, we've been going through the book of Ruth, haven't we? And I'll just recap the story for those uh, coming maybe uh, for the first time or who weren't here the last couple of weeks, that there's a man called Elimelech, a, a man in Judah, and he doesn't do the right thing. He takes his wife and his two sons out of Israel to live in Moab because he thinks it's going to be better there, but it doesn't really turn out very well. His two sons married two Moabite women, which they weren't supposed to do under the law of Moses. And they then both died, and he died, which left his wife, Naomi, as a widow with these two daughters-in-law. And Orpah goes back to her gods and to her family. But Ruth says that she will go with Naomi. And the only reason, really, that she goes with Naomi to Israel 
to live in Israel is because she's come to love the God of Israel, although she is a Moabite woman. And she leaves her parents, her family and everything because she wants to come under the shadow of the God of Israel, even though a Moabite could not enter into the congregation of Israel. Well, they get back to Bethlehem and, and they are hungry. They are desperately hungry. And Ruth goes to glean, to pick up bits of dropped corn and barley that were in the field. And it happened, it was obviously God's hand, that it was a bit of land that belonged to a wealthy man called Boaz, who it turns out is her relative or relative of her family, uh, her, her husband, the former husband's family. So this Boaz is a very godly man, a very powerful man, and he's an older man, and he falls in love with Ruth, and it seems Ruth kind of falls in love with him as well. But there's an awful lot between them. And so this was at the beginning of the barley harvest that they first met. And he invites her to eat with him and he gives her bread and wine, which we thought about last week and said, look, that points forward to the bread and wine that we take. But this Boaz is Jesus and Ruth falls on her face when he invites her to, to eat with him and says, who am I? But you should take notice of me. I'm a farmer. I'm a, a Moabitess. Uh, I'm dirt poor and you're so wealthy and powerful and you're a Jew. Why would you take interest in me? And I said that this was not any kind of anything abusive. This was not uh, some kind of, you know, the powerful guy sexually exploiting the vulnerable woman. I don't think so at all. It was genuine in loveness based on spiritual attraction and God blessed it. Well, that was at the beginning of the barley harvest and now it's the end of the wheat harvest, which is about six weeks. And he apparently hasn't made a move. So we pick up the story in Ruth 3, verse 1. Naomi, Ruth's mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, shall I not seek rest for you, that it may be well with you? And she then has a plan. She says, isn't Boaz our kinsman with whose maidens you were? And behold, he winnows barley tonight in the threshing floor. So wash yourself, anoint yourself, get dressed up, you know, make yourself look pretty and attractive and go down to the threshing floor, but don't make yourself known to the man until he's finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, note the place where he shall lie and you shall go in, uncover his feet and lay down. Then he will tell you what you shall do. She said to her, all that you say, I will do. She went down to the threshing floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law told her. When Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, you know, this means every time that that phrase is used in the Bible, he drunk and his heart was merry, it does mean he was drunk, somewhat drunk. He went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain and she came softly, uncovered his feet and laid herself down. It happened at midnight, but the man was startled and turned himself and noticed a woman lay at his feet and he said, who are you? She said, I'm Ruth, your handmaid. Therefore spread your skirt over your handmaid for you are a near kinsman. He said, blessed are you by Yahweh, my daughter. You've shown more grace in the latter end than at the beginning. Inasmuch as much as you didn't go after young men, whether poor or rich. He's an old guy, right? And so he takes this as a, a nudge that, will you marry me? Now, my daughter, don't be afraid. I will do to you all that you say. So yeah, this is a yes. For all my people in this city know that you are a worthy woman. Now it is true that I am a near kinsman, but there is a kinsman nearer than I. You see, if, you, if a man died and left a widow, his brother, or in the end, his relatives could marry his widow and raise up children in his name. Okay, that's the illusion here. So Boaz says, yep, I can do this, but there's actually a closer relative than me. But stay this night and in the morning. If he will perform to you the part of a kinsman, so be it. Let him do the kinsman's part. But if he will not do the part of a kinsman for you, then will I do the part of a kinsman for you as Yahweh lives. Lie down until the morning. She lay at his feet until the morning. She rose up in the dark, for he said, let it not be known that a woman came to the threshing floor. He said, bring the mantle that is on you and hold it. Now, the mantle is the veil. And a single woman was always veiled. 
And the veil wasn't just a piece of material that dangled in front of your face, it was part of your whole headgear. So he says, bring the veil, the mantle that is on you and hold it. So she, she takes off the sign that she's a single woman and she held it and he measured six measures of barley and laid it on her and he went into the city and the miserable critics say, ah, the Bible's wrong on that. How on earth could she have carried six measures of barley? Yeah, well, the point is that there she was load, laden down with blessing of bread as we have from the Lord. When she came to her mother-in-law, she said, how did it go, my daughter? She told her all that the man had done to her. And she said, he gave me these six measures of barley. For he said, don't go empty to your mother-in-law. She said, sit still, my daughter, until you know how the matter will end. For the man will not be at rest until he has finished the thing this day. Now, this is a wonderful story. Let's go back to verse one. Naomi says, my daughter, shall I not seek rest for you? Now, what she means by that is I'm going to try and get you married. She says in chapter one, verse nine, and you may like to just look back at Ruth one, verse nine. She says to, to Naomi, sorry, she says to Ruth and Orpah, her sister, Yahweh grant you that you may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. So to find rest, means to get married. And so Naomi has said, may Yahweh give you rest. May he give you a husband and a family. But now she says, my daughter, chapter three, verse one, my daughter, shall I not seek rest for you? Well, you can read this one of two ways. You can read it that, yeah, God helps those who help themselves. She has sort of prayed to Yahweh, please find rest, find a family. Find a husband and a family for my daughter-in-law, Ruth. And so now she's saying, yeah, well, I better do it. I better do my part. Yeah, you can read it that way. Or you can read it another way. You can read it that she was impatient. Six weeks have gone by since Ruth has met Boaz and, and, and the mother-in-law is like, well, come on, aren't you getting married? Uh, no, no normal people get married in just six weeks, you know, you don't meet someone in a coffee shop and oh, six weeks later, oh, you, you married. It's not quite how sensible life goes, I think people do, but um, it's, um, usually that's not the way it's done, is it? Um, but one side is often a bit impatient. So <laughs> the, the whole story rings true. People say the Bible's not true. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the reason I give for the Bible being true is that the whole thing is so psychologically credible. <laughs> this is so credible. Absolutely. Now, what she, she suggests, what Naomi suggests is, well, it's a hard chapter to interpret. Right? It is hard. But in my opinion, and I only give you my take, I don't think this is a great idea that she comes up with. She says, look, harvest is over. And... Boaz is going to be on the threshing floor because now this is the last day of harvest. And you do yourself up pretty, girl. Yeah, get your hair done. Anoint yourself. Get dressed up in your best clothes. Wash yourself. And while he's lying there sort of drunk because they always celebrated the, the uh, in-gathering, the harvest is finished by, I'm afraid, getting drunk. You go to the threshing floor and you lie down, uncover him and lie down next to him and you'll see what will happen. Well, verse four, uncover his feet. That is a euphemism and a euphemism means something uh, possibly rude or something very intimate spoken of in an indirect way. In Hebrew, or biblical Hebrew, to uncover the feet means to uncover your sexual organs. And you have the very same phrase used in Ezekiel about this. Exactly the same phrase is used in that context. Well, in my opinion, Naomi is saying to Ruth, look, do yourself up pretty. The guy who could marry you and save us all, this wealthy guy, he's, he's going to be kind of half drunk 
on his threshing floor. Go up there, make yourself look pretty and sexually compromise him. That is how I read this. I know this is not the reading of, shall we say, Sunday School Christianity, where everybody is all beautiful and wonderful and, you know, there's cops and robbers and everybody's either a goody or a baddie and, you know. That's how I read this. This was Naomi's plan to sexually compromise Boaz by getting him basically in a half-drunk state to sleep with Ruth and then, ah, you've got to marry me. I suggest that if this whole incident that you have here had not happened, I reckon Boaz would have married Ruth anyway. Just not maybe as quickly as Naomi wanted it to happen. And you see, that is so typical of us, isn't it? That God loves us and the Lord Jesus has fallen in love with us and has this special interest in us. But we are impatient and we want to force things through in our own strength, in our own way. The whole thing is suboptimal, I would say, that Boaz does not sleep with Ruth, so that's very good. Um, and Ruth does not uh, do any more than what she is described as doing. And that, that their integrity stands out there. And I think that's the, uh, the force, really, of it saying that she rose up in the dark, uh, verse 14, um, and she left before one could know another. So I think that um, that implies that they uh, did not sleep with each other. But you know, Boaz is also, well, verse seven, uh, drunk and his heart was merry and he lay down to sleep. Um, you know, this is not Boaz at his best either. And it's a lovely story, and this is the only bit in the whole Ruth story that rather, I won't say spoils it, but it, it, it is human. And I think it is a very nicely done reminder that nobody is perfect and that God works through human weakness. So, as I say, verse one, Naomi says, my daughter, shall I not seek rest for you? Well, she's just prayed earlier in chapter one, Yahweh, May he find rest for you. May he find you, family. Oh no, but uh, I've got to. Uh, I've got to do it now in my own strength. That that is my reading of this, and that her suggestion that Ruth some kind of goes up and compromises Boaz and uncovers his nakedness late at night when he's half drunk, when she's all dressed up pretty. You know, I, I don't think this is a great idea. That's my reading of it. Apologies, folks, if that is not how you want to see it, or if that is offensive to you, but that, that, that is that's how I read it. But as we're going to see, actually spirituality and godliness do shine through the whole thing. And it is impatience. It is absolute impatience in, in waiting for God to, to act. So then, <clears throat> I think you also see, if my reading of this is right, you see a similarity with what happened to Jacob when he also was drunk and he was deceived into sleeping with Leah and therefore having to marry Leah when he actually wanted to marry Rachel. And I think this idea also of deceiving a man into having sex with you is similar to what Tamar did to Judah. And it's interesting in chapter four that the, the people of the town of Bethlehem, when eventually Boaz and Ruth are married and have had a baby and that, they, they say, may you be blessed with the fertility of Tamar. You know, a strange uh, person to choose uh, as an example of fertility. And I wonder if that was said tongue in cheek. That, uh, <clears throat> yeah, she was a manipulator as well. And, uh, well, Ruth, yes, there we are. And God bless you, Ruth, as Tamar was blessed. That's just in passing. So it, it all was a bit, you know, as I say, suboptimal, whether you call it a sin, what happened here, I don't know, but it was 
I think it would have been a sin if she did what Naomi actually wanted her to do. But as it turned out, I think it was all a bit, well, not the best you know, kind of thing. And there are, there's a difference, I think, between point blank sin and what I would call suboptimal behavior. We could do better, should have done better, uh, etc. So <clears throat> we inquire then, verse eight, at midnight, the man was startled and turned himself and noticed a woman lay at his feet. Why was he so jumpy? Well, in Hosea chapter nine, you have a description of what happened at the harvest floors, at the threshing floors at the time of harvest. And Israel are told, your threshing floors are full of prostitutes getting drunk. And I think he thought, he woke up, oh, there's a woman here. What have I done? I was a bit drunk. Did I sleep with a prostitute? He, and again, you see that he has a, a genuine conscience. So he says, verse nine, who are you? And she has taken the initiative and spread his skirt over herself just as Naomi told her to. But if you go back to chapter 2, verse 12, Boaz says to Ruth that he is very impressed with her because she has come to dwell beneath the shadow of Yahweh's wings. And this word wings is the same word for skirt, the wings of his garment. So I think she, as I said, spirituality shines through here. Although Naomi's original plan, I think, was not at all honorable and was a compromise, seeking to compromise Boaz. Actually, Ruth does it all from a more spiritual way. She's alluding to how he has said to her, you came to dwell underneath the skirt, underneath the wings of Yahweh of God, the God of Israel. So she lifts up his skirt and puts it over herself, as if to say, you, Boaz, represent to me, Yahweh, God of Israel, will you accept me? Yeah, she's asking him to marry her, that is so. But she is doing so on a spiritual basis. Now, the idea of spreading a skirt over a woman is used in Ezekiel when God says, I met you, Israel, in the wilderness, and I spread my skirt over you because your time was the time of love. And as I say, the, the word skirt and the word wing are the same in Hebrew. So the idea of spreading your skirt, spreading your wings, alluding to how birds spread their wings when they're mating. So Ruth does take initiative here. She says, please spread your skirt, over your wings over me. She's actually using the same words that are used in the law of Moses and Exodus for how the cherubim spread their wings over the ark. And on top of the mercy seat, on top of the box that was the ark of the covenant, there was the blood of atonement representing the Lord Jesus. So she's saying that I want to come right there under the, the wings of the cherubim, and you, Boaz, your skirt represents that. But, as I say, Naomi had a different idea, because to uncover a man, to uncover someone's skirt, was a euphemism for sex. For example, in Deuteronomy 27, the cursed is he who lies with his father's wife, because he has uncovered his father's skirt. A man must not take his father's wife, earlier in Deuteronomy, and shall not uncover his father's skirt. So you see, Naomi intended this one way, but Ruth takes it another way. So again, you know, she presents extremely well, really, as someone who was in a difficult position. She had a mother-in-law biting her ear on this, that, and the other. Come on, take the initiative, do this, do that. And yet she also, of course, <laughs> does love Boaz, and he loves her. 
And so it is a beautiful relationship. And so I think you see that despite human weakness, big weakness of Naomi, and I'm not a big fan of Naomi, Mara, as she wanted to be known, bitter. Um, but Ruth and Boaz were human. Boaz is lying here half drunk. Um, but it's beautiful how God weaves his beautiful way through all this weakness to produce an absolutely beautiful romance that ends up in Obed being born, who becomes the, the, the father of David and therefore the ancestor of the Lord Jesus. So he responds to her, verse 10, he said, blessed are you by Yahweh, my daughter, you've shown more grace in the latter end than at the beginning. He's saying, you showed grace to your mother-in-law, didn't you, to Naomi, and now you're showing grace to me. I'm an old man. You didn't run after young men, whether poor or rich, but you came for me, the old guy, because yes, you did see in me someone who truly loves and represents the God of Israel. And he says, you've shown me grace by wanting to marry. Me. And yet it was Boaz who had shown her grace. Chapter two, verse 20, Naomi says, blessed be he, that's Boaz, who has shown grace to you, chesed, grace. So Boaz showed grace to Ruth and Ruth showed grace to Boaz. And you see there how this is how grace, God's grace works. All the way through the whole thing, the source of the grace was God. As we read in chapter 2, verse 20, blessed be Boaz of Yahweh, who has not left off his grace, maybe Boaz's grace, to the living and to the dead. God's grace. It's ambiguous. The point is that God is the source of grace, this undeserved favor, this pure gift. He had shown it, Boaz had reflected it to Ruth, and Ruth has now reflected it back to Boaz. This makes sense of an otherwise difficult passage in Peter in the New Testament, where we read about the manifold grace of God. When you look up that word manifold in Greek, it means the refracted, the multicolored grace of God. How can grace be refracted? The idea is that you know, light comes to a prism and then it's refracted into all the various component colors, into all the colors of the rainbow. And that's, this is the idea, you see, that God's grace comes and it is then broken up by us as it passes through us into something even more beautiful. God's grace came to Boaz, Boaz showed it to Ruth, Ruth now shows it to Boaz. So if you show grace, it will in some way be refracted even more beautifully. Now, as most of you know, I spent many, many years running a soup kitchen in Riga. And I don't know how many tens of thousands of bowls of soup we gave out. And you know, when you do it in the long haul, you think, what's the point of this? Do these people get it? You know, people come demanding, you know, oh, I didn't like the soup today. Where, where's the, um, where there's not enough sugar in the coffee. And you think, ah, is this worth it? You know, someone's rude to you. You know, who do you people think you are? Well, we're just volunteers doing this out because of God's grace. No, we're not paid to do it, blah, blah. And at times you think there's no point showing grace in this world because nobody gets it. But in the end, somebody somewhere at some time, maybe unknown to you, will refract further the grace that you have shown to them. Somewhere, somebody, sometime will do this. Grace is not expended in vain. God, of course, knows all about this better than you and me do, because he's spending all his grace and love to a humanity that basically doesn't want to know. Let's face it. But here and there, there's a bloke like Duncan, Arash, or Mark, or somebody who gets it and responds. The fact that you were gracious to me means that I am going to be generous or kind to the next random person who asks me for some help or, or whatever. It does refract 
further. And you see it beautifully here when he, when Boaz says to Ruth, you have shown grace to me. Well, verse 11, now my daughter, don't be afraid. I'll do all that you say. This is a yes. You've taken the initiative, although I do love you. And I've got this special interest in you. And I asked you to have bread and wine with me. And I'll let you know that I, I've got, a, got my eye on you. Okay, I love you. And now you've come to me and asked me to marry you. I will do to you all that you say. Yes, dear, this is a yes. But he goes on to say, but it, it's not so easy, dear, because actually there is somebody who is a closer relative to your late husband than myself, who's actually got the right to marry you and all that. And it's his duty, not mine. Now, don't forget, Boaz was very powerful. He was wealthy and powerful. He could have said, oh, great, this younger, much younger woman wants to marry me, and she clearly fancies me. Oh, yeah, I'll sleep with her right now. And Oh, yeah, well, I can, you know, money talks, right? I, I'll just arrange it. Yeah, I'll just grab her for myself. But he, see, he doesn't do that. He says, no, let's not sleep with each other. Let's get this done properly. And, yeah, there's a barrier. There's a legal barrier. But I shall work through that. And when I've worked through it, in front of all the evidence, all, all the witnesses as evidence, we'll do it properly. And you see, this is how God is with us. God could just pick up you and me and force us into his kingdom because he loves us and he likes us. He could do that, but he doesn't. This is the beauty of God's operation through the Lord Jesus Christ. That, as Paul likes to make this point in Romans, that he could have just saved us, but through what was done in the Lord Jesus as someone of our nature, our representative, and so on, who was perfect, he did it, he achieved our salvation in a legitimate way. Not by just saying, look, I'm God Almighty, I can do what I want. I can break my own rules, I can break my own principles. Why not? I'm God. He doesn't do that. We who are sinners, who should therefore die, because we sinned on the wages of sin is death, are saved in a legitimate way. It, it, it's not as if God says, okay, I'll turn a blind eye to that. Okay, well, I, I, oh, let's just say I didn't see that. Let's force it through. Let's make it work by my power. Not quite like that. You could do. Just like Boaz could have said, well, I'm the powerful guy. I can sleep with her. I can marry her. Yeah, why not? No problem. I'll sort it all out. But he doesn't. He resolves all this in a legitimate way. And that is how God has worked through the Lord Jesus. None of us understand the mechanics of the atonement of what was achieved in the body and blood of the Lord Jesus to the end. Uh, but what we do know is that it was this way so that our salvation as sinners doomed to death would be in a sense legitimate and would not be a breaking of rules and would not be turning a blind eye, special cases and all this kind of stuff. It's very beautiful, our redemption, just as what Boaz does here is very beautiful and of absolute integrity all the way through. So much was against Ruth. And I want at this point to just remind ourselves that she said in chapter 1, verse 16 to Naomi, no, nope, I'm quitting with my gods, I'm leaving Moab. Your God, Yahweh, shall be my God. Your people, Israel, shall be my people. And where you die, I will die. But she says, your people will be my people. But the law of Moses said, a Moabite, she was a Moabite. Seven times the record says Ruth the Moabite. A Moabite cannot enter into the congregation of my people, God said. But she says, your people will be my people. But the law of Moses had said, a Moabite shall not enter into the congregation of my people. But plus, Israel were not to marry Moabites. So there's a lot against her. But she really wants this relationship with God, with the God of Israel, and to have his people as her people, and to have him as her God. Don't forget, Israel, according to the law of Moses, were not to tattoo themselves like the nations around them. She was tattooed, I'm sure she was. I love Chemosh. 
me and Molek or whatever, her body would have had tattoos on it, maybe a face. She would have not been attractive to a godly Israelite. So she's got that against her. She's a Moabite woman. Now, Moabite women are presented in the Bible as the, uh, let's say, femme fatale, like the, uh, the, the woman who is fatal, who is um, femme fatale uh, to, uh, to, to, to men, particularly Israelite men. Numbers 25, it's the women of Moab who led Israel astray. As soon as you talked about a Moabite woman, woman everyone would have said, oh, yeah, she'd be a whore. Yeah, that was the image that they had. And it's an image that you find in the Bible itself. Now, this whole thing in Ruth, we're told in chapter one, took place in the time of the judges. But in the time of the judges, the Moabites had invaded Israel and abused them. Israelites didn't like Moabites. She's a Moab. She's from Moab. And she's a Moabite woman. She was poor. She was out there gleaning and asking if, uh, can I not just glean around the edges, but can I glean in the center of the field? From one word, and that was hunger. She was hungry. That's why she was doing it. She was desperately hungry. She was totally poor. She had nothing. And Boaz is this rich guy, this Israelite, and this righteous Israelite who doesn't want to marry a Moabite woman, according to the law. The other thing is that she had no male relative. Okay, she had left, as Boaz says, you left your mother and your father when you came to Israel. So she had no father. She had no brothers. She'd quit with her family. She had no husband. He died. She had no father-in-law, Elimelech. He died. She was a woman with no male relative. Now, in the Middle East, even to this day, in some parts of it, a woman with absolutely no male relative is just a non-person. You are not a legal entity. And how can you get married? And some of the archaeological inscriptions that have been uncovered talk about this. The other thing is she was not a virgin. She had been married for 10 years in Moab and had produced no children. Well, in the eyes of Middle Eastern society, of course, it wouldn't be the man who was to blame. She was not fertile. That's how they understood it. You've been married for 10 years and you didn't produce a kid. It must be the woman's fault. That's what they thought in those days. And men wanted to marry women in order to have a kid. Kids were everything. And, of course, the whole idea of Boaz marrying her was to raise up seed for her late husband. But she had been married for 10 years and had not had children. She also was surely not that young. She is presented as a young woman relative to Elimelech, sorry, relative to Boaz. Uh, but she... She'd been married for 10 years. I don't think she was probably that young, but we don't know. The other thing is that Boaz was not actually the closest relative. As he says, there's a, a closer one than me. Also, this whole thing about what's called the Levirate Law, where if a man died, his brother could marry his widow and produce children. Well, when you look at that in the Law of Moses, what it says is, if brothers dwell together, if they're living together, and one of them's married and he dies, then one of his brothers can marry his widow and have children in his name. I don't think that it really envisages distant relatives like Boaz marrying the widow. I don't think that is really in view in that law. There are a whole mass of issues that would make the marriage of Ruth and Boaz pretty well impossible. Now, you and I are the same. Boaz is described as the kinsman redeemer, just like the Lord Jesus, of our nature, one of us, one of our family, 
who will stand up for us, who will come to save us in our hard times. Yeah, <clears throat> it all seems so impossible. I am not such a spiritual person. I sin. I, it seems, cannot stop sinning. I should be, could be, ought to be far better than I am. But there seems something within me or within just the environment and the situation that I find myself that holds me back from being as I should be for, for the Lord Jesus. And he is in heaven, right? He is the son of God. He is the king of the cosmos. And is this really so that a man, son of God, who quite rightly rose from the dead and lives forever, who is located so far away from me, would have a special number on, on Duncan, on Miriam, on Phil. Is that really so? How can that be? There seem so many barriers. And in our weak moments, of course, we see all those barriers. But there was so much between Ruth and Boaz. But he says to her, I will do this. I will do this. But then he says, but look, it's going to be easy because there's a closer relative than me. And we've got to sort that one out. I will do this. And so as we face off, as it were, against the Lord Jesus, and as we examine ourselves about our relationship with Jesus, you ask yourself, <clears throat> how can this be possible? And you come to trust in the words of Boaz, which are, as it were, the words of Jesus. I will make this work. I will do what you say. Have you ever said to Jesus, I want to be saved. I want to live forever. Would you save me? I have, and I encourage you to say those words on your knees to the Lord Jesus. Will you save me, please? Will you please give me eternal life? Will you please bring me into your kingdom? And the answer is, I will do it. But it's a lot of stuff to sort out. <clears throat> but I will do it. Don't worry. And then he says to her, give me your veil, your mantle, it says in some Bibles. But as I said, the mantle, the veil, was all part of quite a big piece of headgear. You know, a, a veil as worn in the Middle East was not just a, you know, like a, a sort of a face mask uh, in front of you that was sort of tied around your ears. It was part of a whole, a, a whole piece of headgear. And he says, take it off. So she's no longer a single woman. That's what single women wore. Uh, she takes it all off. He says, let me pour all this, all this uh, <clears throat> barley, six meters of barley, into, into your veil. So she goes home with it. And it's as if he is saying, I didn't give you my seed last night, physically, as in, you know. But I'll give you loads and loads and loads of seed right now. And you take that back to your mother-in-law. Because he says, verse 17, Sorry. <clears throat> yeah, he says, don't go empty to your mother-in-law. Naomi had lamented in chapter 1, verse 21, I left Judah full and I returned empty. Boaz had probably heard that and he said, no, don't go empty to your mother-in-law. Go with all this massive six measures of barley. Well, no, Naomi returning empty was the direct consequence of her sin, basically, her misjudgments. And we do have consequence for our sins and our misjudgments. But I think Boaz, like the Lord Jesus, is saying, I can reverse that. Now, you take all this massive amount of seed back to your mother-in-law so that she is not empty. This is what God does. He reverses consequences. Wages of sin is death. So what does that mean? We're going to die. We've all sinned. We're going to die, stay dead forever? No. And then Naomi says, verse 18, the man will not be in rest until he has finished or fulfilled the thing this day. Those words are quoted in Isaiah, which has got a lot of allusion to Ruth. There Israel were, or Judah were in exile, and 
Isaiah is saying to them, God will, <clears throat> God will revive you. God loves you. You may be in exile, but he is going to return you. And Isaiah quotes this pretty well by saying that God will not be in rest until he has finished the restoration of his people. God is not in rest until he has got us for himself. And so here we are. <clears throat> Forget for all time the idea that God is passive and inactive, that yeah, it's all down to us. Believe me, beyond the steely silence of the skies, there is a God who is so active for you. There is a Jesus who is so active for you, who is restless, who is restless until he's finished this plan to redeem you. Because believe it, please, he has a special number on you. He has got this special interest in you. And he is working through all the barriers of who we are by nature. My Ruth was a Moabite, our history, uh, all the rest of it. He's working through all that to save you. And that grace will come true. You, you, you have to take initiative. Yes, Ruth took the initiative. She comes to him by night and says, well, look, <laughs> here I am. I've done my hair up pretty and all that, but you know, as my mother-in-law told me to, but look here, I'm here, I, I, I'm for you. With all my barriers, with all the problems of my nature, with all the problems of who I am as a woman, with all the problems of my past, that I was 10 years married with no kid, um, with all that stuff, but I, yeah, yeah, for, for who I am and for all I am, I am yours. And he says, yes, I will do it, but there's the barriers, but we shall get through them. This is the wonderful thing. Nothing is impossible with him. And when we say nothing is impossible, the nothing that is impossible is all our mixed up past, present, future, structure by nature, whatever it might be. None of that is a barrier. Now, we are to reflect that grace to other people and to encourage people that you are not in an impossible position, that you are not too far gone, that the, the dice is not loaded against you, as people feel. Jesus is for everyone. Yes, that is the point. Thank you. So we come then to focus our minds on the bread and wine. Let's, uh, let's focus on the, on the bread. Um, <clears throat> uh, Mike Flaherty, would you like to give thanks for, for the bread? Our loving Father in heaven, dear Lord, we come before you now thankful for your dear son, Jesus. And though we know we are unworthy in your sight and not deserving of your great love, you have seen something in us that you desire and you have given us your son. And we remember him now and his emblems before him, that bread. The bread made up from many seeds that were crushed and ground that it may form a loaf. And we are thankful, Father, that you have called us to be part of him. Dear Lord, thank you. Thank you for your son, Jesus, and for the emblems now before us. Amen. Amen. So this bread then represents the body of our Lord Jesus. Let's give thanks for the cup. Um, Dan Mui, would you like to um, give thanks for the cup? Dear Father, 
Thank you so much for this cup, a representation of life eternal. His blood is a testimony to your oath that you will save us from sin and death. And we are witnesses to that promise. As we're holding this cup so close to our hearts, with all our hearts, we appreciate your gift of life. And his blood is the seal of your love for us all. And until that glorious day of his return, we'll keep doing this in his honor and in his precious name, Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. So we take this in honor and stand with you, <laughs> of him and his love for us. Well, would anyone like to um, anyone like to pray at all? Um, Shisomo, Modesta, anybody like to uh, give a prayer? Lainey, anybody is welcome to uh, to pray um, at this point. Okay, just uh, yeah. yeah. Okay, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness and for your mercies. We thank you, Father, that uh, we have allowed us to see this day. 